concerts, filmmakers, entertainment, and all your listening needs. Listen now to Talk Now Radio, where no topic is taboo. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Talk Now Radio. This is your host, Royce the Redneck Radio Man. And joining me today is going to be Lynn Keston. And we're going to be talking about his latest book, The Secret Journey to Planet Serpo. And this is a true story of military travel. And I don't know how many people out there in listening, uh, Bill, are familiar with this story. Um... It came out back in about roughly 2004, 2005 on the web that an anonymous had been posting to Victor Martinez's site and um, was giving away the details to this here trip to planet Serpo when he wasn't supposed to. Now, as I understand it, this book is about this project, um, and uh, all the information has already been put out there, and I think some of it... And Lynn may want to correct me on this, is uh, been declassified and is now available to the public. Did I get that part correct, Lynn? Well, actually, all of it has been available to the public since it was first put out there in um, November of 2005. Well, I know that. I mean, um, other words, with the government's blessing, in other words. Well, it was with the government's blessing because it was declassified in 2005 because the mandatory 25-year waiting period had elapsed. Yeah, now, I read that in, that part in your book. Uh, uh, I don't know, maybe it's just me. I, I may not have a good understanding of how they uh, operate, but I kind of had the impression that even though the 25-year period was over, there could be higher-ups in there that would still rather it not be volunteered to the public, but rather make them go look for it, in other words. Well, you know, Anonymous chose to reveal it, and uh, they couldn't stop him, really. And he wasn't alone. He was representing five, uh, five other BIA personnel, three of whom are retired and three of whom were active. So they were called the BIA Six. Right. Uh, it wasn't just you know, Anonymous. He was the spokesman. Right, and I remember them uh, putting that up on the website at the time. And I know he posted an awful lot of stuff to the site. I was, uh, I followed it for several months there myself. And then I got really busy on other projects and I wasn't able to keep up with it anymore, but I thought it was very fascinating even back then. And I'm really surprised it's taken this long for a book to come out about it. I mean, I was, I was kind of expecting one within the next two years. Well, what happened was, I think, um, all the people that I spoke to back in that period, uh, who I thought would be very fascinated and interested in this subject, all showed skepticism. They all, they all seem to take the position that, well, I just don't know if I can believe this. And that's, that's basically what happened. It just, people just couldn't believe that this really happened and so they lost interest. But I knew very well that this, this was a real story here after talking to uh, Bill Ryan for two hours at the UFO Congress in 2006. Well, so, uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Clear, yeah, it became clear to me that the story was real. Well, I'll be honest with you. Back then, I was amongst the, um, well, I wouldn't say skeptical, more half skeptical. Part of me was like it made total sense, but another part was, well, we're getting this information kind of easy, you know what I mean? So uh, I really didn't know. I was kind of straddling the fence line, didn't know which way I wanted to go with it. But I knew I wanted to learn more about it, in other words. Well, that was typical. That was a typical reaction, exactly. And that's what kept people uh, floating up there in, uh, non-committal, in a non-committal place. But after talking to, uh, to Bill Ryan, I knew that the story was true. Because I could, I could relate it to many other things that I had already uh, learned. So putting it all together, I, I could see that it was, it was a real story. Well, then you've been on my show once before, so you probably have over now, but usually one of the first things I do is ask my guests to, um, you know, tell a little something about themselves and what got them interested in the, you know, book that we're talking about. And I didn't quite jump right into that one yet, and I'm going to go ahead and do that now, but before I do, I want to also mention everybody, if you want to learn more, Lynn's website is www.at-secrethistory.com forward slash index html and for you folks that are listening at youtube or itunes or somewhere else 
We'd love to have you in the chat room here with us. The address is www.talknowradio.com. The re- a reminder to everybody, this show used to be Paranormal Palace Radio, but I decided I wanted to cover more than just the paranormal. I wanted to try to cover everything I could think of, so I named it Talk Now and turned it from a paranormal show into a variety show. I hope everybody enjoys it. I, I basically just thought I had a chance to learn a lot more than I was learning focusing on one area. And, um, Lynn, why don't we go ahead real quick, like, before we forget, tell them about your book signing you got coming up. Yeah, uh, for people in the Phoenix, living in the Phoenix area or close by, uh, I will have a book signing at the Changing Hands Bookstore, uh, at 6528 South McClintock Drive in Tempe, Arizona, on August the 16th. Uh, that's a Friday night at 7 p.m. As part of the book signing, I'll be doing a one-hour uh, PowerPoint presentation of the Circle story um, at 7 o'clock, and then there'll be a discussion on the book signing afterwards. So try and make it if you're in the area. Love to have you. I'm in the Houston area, but if I was out there, I would sure enough stop by. Uh, also, everybody, if you want to call in and ask questions, the number is 832-632-7904. So, Lynn... Why don't you tell everybody here listening that's not familiar with you a little bit about yourself and what got you involved in writing this particular book? Well, you know, I've been writing articles for Atlantis Rising for 14 years, um, most of them on the UFO, sub- on the UFO subject matter. Uh, in fact, I uh, starting starting really in um, well, let's see, starting in 1980 something. I can't recall when. Uh, I became the, uh, the, basically the UFO writer for the magazine. And, uh, by, by uh, 2011, I had written 52 articles for Atlantis Rising. We took 26 of those articles and put them together, and they became our first book, Secret History of Extraterrestrials, which was released in 2011, um, in November. And uh, the book is still selling well and got very good reviews. And then uh, two years later, I wrote my new book, uh, Secret Journey to Planet Serpo. Actually, the, the Serpo story was a chapter in the previous book as well. It took up one chapter in that book as well, but I knew it needed to be expanded. And so that's why, um, with the publisher's uh, agreement, we decided to do a book on the uh, a whole book on the subject. Okay. In fact, I interviewed you about your other book, and um, I actually read a copy of it, and I thought it was a very fascinating book, and I really enjoyed this book, too, as well, and it covered a whole lot of material that I thought we needed to... Well, I had some questions right here. One of them we've already covered here. Let me bring myself back to where I was at. Okay. Why don't we start with you... um, because, like I said at the beginning here, not everybody's familiar with Planet Serpo. Why don't you tell everybody, the listeners, give them a kind of a briefing on it to bring everybody up to speed on it. Uh, what happened, you mean? Uh, well, what happened was it all started basically with, uh, with, with Roswell. Uh, when Roswell occurred uh, in July of 1947, there, there were five dead aliens found with the ship and one live alien. And that live alien made all the difference in the world, and that's what started the whole, the whole, the whole process. The, uh, the live alien was taken to Los Alamos uh, laboratories, and the scientists there found a way to communicate with him and asked him a lot of questions. And it turned out that he had a communications device on the Roswell craft. And they started trying to get it to work, because it communicated, the device allowed him to communicate with his home planet. Uh, so after uh, after uh, experimenting with it for five years, they could not get it to work until finally, in 1952, one of the scientists realized that it might work if they rehooked it up to the power source on the crash disk. And when they did that, it worked. And so they got... They got it working, and they were able to communicate with his home planet, and he immediately sent uh, six messages to his home planet. One of those messages 
suggested an exchange program. And that was done at the uh, suggestion of his military handler, who was, I believe, a major. Uh, the major, this major was, was the one guy that was able to communicate very effectively with him. And he became his, his handler. Now that suggestion for the exchange program probably came down from a much higher place. Possibly from Eisenhower, President Eisenhower himself. So, uh, but that went unanswered. Uh, just before the alien died in 1952, he did receive an answer suggesting a uh, return visit 10 years down the road. The uh, the people of Los Alamos were scratching their heads and they figured, well, how could they be talking about something 10 years away? But before they could straighten it out, he died. The alien died. So they never got, they never got straightened out, really. And then after he died, the uh, scientists were able to continue to use the communications device and slowly but surely they perfected that communication with the alien home planet. And eventually they were able to communicate in uh, rough English. It took a long time. It took years. And uh, by the time they really had it, all the bugs basically worked out. President Kennedy uh, was in office. And he was briefed on the whole project, and he approved the, the idea of an exchange program. And that's how it all began. That's how the whole thing started. Now, Kennedy was aware that there was an alien in the craft that crashed in Roswell all along, uh, at least after he was briefed. Is that correct? Yeah. We don't know that. We don't know how much they told him. All we know about is that they did tell him about the the fact that the, the alien was communicating with his home planet. Oh, but in order, okay. for, in order for him to know that, he had to know about Roswell as well. And my guess is that they, they had to brief him about Roswell because the alien survived the Roswell crash. So they must have, they must have told him that. I would think so. That's why I said what I did. But it wasn't because I read it. was because... I was piecing it together in my mind. I, that's where my mind would just naturally went to the same place yours did. Um, so, now, my next question is going to be... Didn't have to, they didn't have to... Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, uh, uh, go ahead. Finish that one because you got my curiosity going. They didn't really have to tell them about Roswell necessarily, but my guess is that they did. The one who got the complete briefing on Roswell was President Reagan. And oh. that's in the... And that's in my book. Yeah. Now, here's what I wanted to mention. Um, it was about Roswell, because I'm familiar that that's about um, 66 years old now. Are there any public domain declassified uh, documents that are uh, like smoking guns evidence about what had transpired there that you're aware of? Well, in my book, I give a complete verbatim uh, description of the debriefing of the briefing of President Reagan by the CIA. The entire story is right in there in Chapter 3. Right. I was reading that, and I was going to ask you a question about that one as well. Uh, on, that was going to be question 6, but I can move up to it and go back. Uh, it was pretty much the transcript of the Reagan briefing with the uh, caretaker. I yes. wanted to ask you, do we have a way to know that this is a legit, a legit document, not just something put out on the web for propaganda, in other words? Well, it didn't. It didn't come out on the web per se. It came out in the in the Serpo. It came out with the Serpo revelations. It was released by anonymous. So it's on the it's on the Serpo website. That's where I took it from. Okay, and that was a pretty in depth meeting in itself. I thought. Well, they covered quite a bit. Um, now the 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 debriefing, the, the briefing itself was was a, a verbatim. A uh, copy of an audio t cassette tape that was de that was retained by the Department of Defense. There were 54 cassettes uh, taken, recorded of that uh, briefing session by the CIA to President Reagan, and they're all basically in the vaults of the Department of Defense. So uh, this this verbatim um, copy was taken from those cassettes. So the, we don't have no way of knowing if there's any copies that's been put in the National Archives or not. Right, exactly. That would be that's interesting good. because uh, it's over 25 years. They were supposed to release them to the National Archives, weren't they? 
Well, I think I think they uh, they wait for an FOI request, or Freedom of Information Act request, and uh, basically I'm going to be doing that very soon. I'm going to be putting in an FOIA request for uh, for all those documents. Yes. Okay, well, that's a good idea. Matter of fact, there's enough material there probably for a whole other book. Well, maybe not for a book itself, but maybe for a supplement or something like that. I'm not sure what. Okay, now, um, for the you know benefit of the listeners, you might want to tell them what the Red Book is. The Red Book uh, is a complete record of all of our contacts with uh, extraterrestrials, starting with uh, Roswell. And actually before Roswell, because there were two cases before Roswell, um, kept in that what they call the Red Book, and every five years it's updated, and every single every single um, incident is, re, is that's reported having to do with UFOs goes through a filtering process. Uh, one of the agencies in charge completely uh, uh, interviews the people and writes everything down, then it slowly filters up to uh, the editor of the Red Book, and the editor decides what is to go into it and what, and what is not to go into it. And then he puts together a, a briefing session for the sitting uh, president of the United States. So everything we have ever done, every interaction with ETs, uh, is in that book. And that, too, is in a vault uh, in the Defense Department. Was uh, Anonymous able to get any copies of that for you by any chance? Any uh, pictures or anything? Well, Anonymous claims that he was the editor of the Red Book. Right. I remember reading that he, in your book. He was. It was his job to sit down and uh, brief, give, a, give a, the sitting president an update of the Red Book. And so he knows exactly uh, what's in it. And uh, that's more or less, since he, since he had those credentials, it becomes more believable that his entire story of the Serpo event must be authentic. Right. Now, I was going to ask you for the, uh, to tell everybody about the planet Serpo connection with Roswell, but we've already covered that, so let's move on to, um, you know, what role did Germany, uh, did Germany had to play in this saga? Because one of the first things you do in your book is you go all the way back to Germany. Well, I wanted to tell the whole story, and the whole story required starting in Germany because that's really where the first uh, anti-gravity aircraft were developed, so-called flying saucers or UFOs or whatever you want to call them. They were developed uh, by the uh, by the, the Nazi uh scientists who were in touch with an underground civilization in Tibet, and the scientific data came from uh, a joint agreement between Hitler and the, uh, the Tibetan civilization. They provided the scientific basis for the development of the, uh, of the uh, uh, anti-gravity craft and a lot of other very advanced uh, weaponry. Uh, this particular pact between the, uh, was between the reptilians and the Nazis. And I wanted to start there because, uh, one of the survivors, a scientist by the name of Victor Schauberger, uh, who helped develop the, the flying saucers for Germany, came to work for, uh, the American government right after the war. He was debriefed for about nine months by the CIA. And uh, then they put him to work in Texas developing uh, anti-gravity technology. Um, that that was an important point because uh, a lot of people probably are aware of the fact that the Germans did develop a, an entire colony in Antarctica, and all this all the top scientists went to Antarctica and continued their work on the uh, anti-gravity technology. Schauberger himself only had a piece of the pie. The real important work was being done in Antarctica. The Germans started that colony in 1938, and from the very beginning, it was meant to be a scientific colony. Its whole purpose was really uh, to develop the capabilities for interplanetary travel. 
It was not a refuge in any sense of the word. So they sent their top scientists there and continued to develop and work on this technology. They even, they even sent a, a, uh, a suicide mission to Mars from Antarctica. So uh, the reason I wanted to tell that story was because what happened next was the British and the Americans found out about the colony in Antarctica and basically we sent an invasion force down there called Operation High Jump in 1946 after the war. Uh, the, uh, it was a task force of 13 naval vessels and 4,700 Marines. They were repulsed by the flying saucers who came from under the water and uh, repelled the invasion. That occurred in, in early 1947, and Admiral Byrd, who was in charge of the task force, reported back to Washington that that the, under, the, the, the underground civilization in, in Antarctica, which they were now calling the Fourth Reich, had this kind of weaponry, and it meant that the United States was now vulnerable to an attack from that civilization. In that, in that particular engagement, uh, 68 Americans died. And so the U.S. Congress would have no illusions about the fact that, that if, they, if they chose to launch an invasion from Antarctica to the U.S., uh, we were going to be very vulnerable. Now, the reason, the reason that I wanted to tell that was because three months later, the alien craft crashed into the desert in New Mexico. Three months after Admiral Byrd returned from Antarctica and informed the Congress that we were vulnerable to an attack, an alien craft crashed into the desert. Well, that changed everything. And since one alien survived, it became clear that we now had another option. We now had another option. So that uh, when, they, when, they deep, when they interviewed that alien and began to understand that we could perhaps get that technology, uh, that's, that's when the entire motivation for the exchange program began. And that's, that's basically why I wanted to tell the entire story. Right. Well, okay, are the reptilians still interfering and in helping other countries out, or are they kind of faded into the background? Well, they pinned all their hopes on the fascist movement. They thought that the combined forces of Japan, who ruled the, who ruled the sea, and Germany, with its, uh, with its tremendous uh, arm, uh, overland armed forces, would be able to impose a fascist dictatorship on the entire planet. And when they failed at that, they then went back into their underground lair. However, uh, we there have been elements of the reptilian groups also have been dealing with with the certain elements of the United States military as well. So they may have gone back underground, but they didn't give up. Yeah, I wouldn't think they had, and I would also think, and I could be wrong about this. It's just my own speculation that if they're going to uh, help another country any time in the future, I would say China's a good one up for grabs right now. Well, you know. Uh, I think that they're pinning their hopes more on on getting the United States. We are really the most powerful nation on the planet. And uh, the reason we won World War II was we were able to bomb Germany and defeat Japan at the same time. And there's really no, we have no, we have no other uh, uh, possible enemies right now. China doesn't even, doesn't even have an aircraft carrier. I think they have one aircraft carrier. They have nowhere near the capability that we have. So needless to say, the reptilians want to be on the side of the power, uh, the power group, and that means the United States. Well, that'd so be pretty interesting if we were uh, trying to play both ends against the middle between the evens and the reptilians, wouldn't it? Well, the evens have just become our friends. They're really a, more of a diplomatic. <laughs> it's more of a diplomatic relationship. Uh, they have given us a lot of information, and. Uh, we have every reason to be very pleased with that relationship. And it's been going on now for, uh, let's see, 37, almost 50 years. They've been back here uh, 10 times since that first 
first exchange program. Now, these evens, they're not the same thing as the grays, are they? No, no connection. They're from a different star system completely. I was actually, uh, heard, what I heard was that the uh, the grays were really a creation of the reptilians, but I just thought I'd check anyway. That's what I heard, too. I heard that the uh, the reptilians basically dominate the grays and that the grays do a lot of the dirty work for the reptilians, yes. I've heard that, too. And if that is the case, that would equate them in the Sumerian language and the ancient astronauts to uh, the reptilians or the ancient gods and the uh, grays would be the Agigi, I would think. But I could... Well, some, something like that. And in, in fact, um, some people think that the Greys are actually a creation of the uh, reptilians. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've had people on my show that, uh, like, I think it was <laughs> Nigel Kerner had mentioned to me that he thought that as well. Well, you know, uh, have you read my book? Uh, yes, sir. Now, if you recall, in the introduction, uh, Anonymous, who was the uh, was the editor of the Red Book, said that we have been dealing with nine other civilizations. Right. Some of them, some of them, he said, were hybrid civilizations that were crossed between the Ebens and were a mechanical life form. So that, you know, the Ebens have been able to, to create and, and to, uh, clone, uh, different, different kinds of creatures. Uh, and so, uh, a lot of the, a lot of the ETs that we do deal with, some of them are really, uh, mechanical uh, android life forms. They're not really completely biological. That's interesting. i got to tell you, that's really interesting because uh, I've had uh, Daryl Sims on, and he made, him and Nigel Kerner both made the observation that um, the gray aliens don't have any kind of genitals or any kind of belly button, and they think it's because they're mechanical, which is what you're just now telling me. And then me and Kathleen Martin just talked about the same thing Last week, and now you and me are talking about it, and I think there's getting to be a consensus here that the Greys could possibly be androids. Yes, they could. As a matter of fact, I, in my first book, I did discuss the fact that the hybrids that they're creating, uh, they were cloning, that in order to reproduce their species, the Greys had to clone because they had, long, they had lost the ability to reproduce by natural means. And if, if they rely on cloning... That would seem to be an indication that they might very well be an android life form and not really a biological life form. Which also I uh, noticed that in your book, uh, The Secret Journey to Planet Circle, and I'm getting ahead of myself with this one, uh, the Evens were also uh, had their own cloning program, which uh, was upsetting to our visitors because they had uh, used some of 308's parts. That's right. Um, one of the Americans, one of the Americans died on the way to Serpo, um, and uh, the Evans took charge of the body. And when the uh, when the commander asked for the body, they said that uh, the body was gone. They had used it. They had used it to clone other create creatures, and uh, that uh, got him very upset. And he demanded uh, to see what was left of the body. And when they sh- they showed him what was left. He was disgusted and revolted, and finally he said, well, where is the entity that you created? And they took him in to see the uh, cloned entity that was part human and part Eben, and he was he was so sickened by it that uh, he said his final statement was, I have seen the dark side of this civilization. Uh, at that time, we didn't know very much about DNA, and we didn't know very much about biotechnology, so it, it's, it's understandable that he might have considered it evil, when they just considered it, they just considered it science. Right. Well, that's the impression yeah. I got from reading your book that um, that the Evens really had no idea that they were doing anything malicious or aggressive. It was just a uh, a scientific project to them. That although our people didn't see, uh, you know, view it that way. In other words, well, that's right. Don't forget, these men went to Circle in 1965, and uh, they had just discovered DNA only a, only a few years earlier. And we had no, there was no sophistication really in terms of, uh, how to do anything like cloning at that point. Now, of course, we're way beyond that. But at that time, it all seemed very evil and dark to us to see a civilization creating these hybrid creatures that were disgusting to 